Hey, good morning, Adriel. Good morning, Jeremy. Hope you had fun in Cebu, gigs on the beach. Yeah, it was fantastic. It's my first time at a conference and had a great time. Just, I don't know, just talking about a lot of other geeks on the beach. I felt like it described me as a target market perfectly, right? I'm a geek. It, I love the beach. Put it together. I think it was like a three-day conference, effectively. And on the last day, right before flying out in the afternoon, I was able to get a boat trip from 7 a.m. to about 1 p.m. and visit three islands. It's wow. Cebu. It was fantastic. April, uh, Om, thank you so much for helping arrange that. <laughs> I was like, just like hating my life when I woke up. But then two hours later, I was like, next to this beautiful ocean. Oh, that's awesome. Like with my goggles and just floating. You floating. <laughs> Look at the fish. And, uh, I think it's nice. Yeah, I recommend the conference. Uh, actually, how different is it having a conference in a more like relaxed setting where everyone's in like shorts and buttoned up suits? I, definitely. I think less business, more relational, right? Because people are just talk, bringing their kids, people are talking about the beach. So I think the less transactional approach, which makes sense if you're holding a conference in Singapore, people are in and out really quick. I think there's a faster pace and people's packed back to back. But I think those relationships get to breathe a little bit more. Because now I can chat for three hours on a boat, you can talk about everything else. And then at the end of the boat ride, you're like, okay, let's swap, what, what's that? I get the business. <laughs> In fact, so tell me, what stage of oh, what's going on like that? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. How about you? How's life for you? Yeah, no, I've been spending time in Manila as well. I think, obviously, AI has been a big topic in terms of how agents can potentially replace a lot of service-based industries, yeah. professional services or BPOs. But also, on the other hand, you have AI companions solving the big lonely problem that a lot of adults or even kids are going through and all the ethical complications that come with AI companions. So yeah, excited to just dive a bit deeper into how, I guess, relationships online have evolved. Back in the day, I'm sure you have played like games where you're playing with like random other players from all over the world, you know, all sorts of age, you know, with all sorts of interesting like relational dynamics. And then now you have evolved, evolving into AI generated like relationships and human beings. So how do, how do you feel about that? What was your experience like growing up playing games with other players and how do you think about it now with AI companion? Yeah, I think this topic for today's discussion, which is AI companions. And I think there's two parts, right? I think there's companions, right? Which is the solution. <laughs> and then there's AI, which is the how, and then the problem, which we've implied, which is loneliness or the desire for companionship. Yeah, when you talk about AI companions, it doesn't feel like it's a new thing, right? First of all, people can be lonely. Then people want companionship and then they feel it digitally and now using AI. And I think for a lot of us who are like millennials and then LD, I think a lot of people already have digital companions already, right? Even for myself, let me say that again. Every today, there are so many games you play and then you get, you know, adventuring party and then there's a female character with a full backstory. There's a male bear bod that can explain everything about life and nature. It's a fool. Everybody's their own story as well. And even back in the day for myself, yeah, I used to be part of these computer games and we, we didn't have the fleshed out narration or anything. So it was all other players, right? So they called it these online worlds with other human players. And so we we're all role-playing our characters. And so we had companions. It just happened to be a human inhabiting a character that we didn't really know, right? So I still remember playing this game called Utopia and I was in secondary school and we were playing this game where it's like turn-based kingdom building game called Utopia. And in that story, I got married to this lady who was actually in, in America. This was verified because somebody else tried to date her in real life. So it was like a dude in other part, part of the world. That I, I don't think she ever knew that I was a, a minor Singapore. Boss. I wear Singapore. I wear Singapore, Singapore whatever. And I was just like, it, it was just like the whole role play of us with your wedding ceremony and all this other stuff. So yeah, she had a companion, I had a companion online. Uh, how about yourself? Did you have any digital companions? Yeah, no, like uh, my friends and I, these days, we always talk about the journey of playing like Maple Story and then how everyone you know, who was playing Maple Story back in their like early teenage years, got married to some other like character. And then we often joke, you know, maybe that female character that we got married to was some like 40, 50 year old uncle on the internet. 
trying to prey on like young little boys. And it is fascinating, right? Like you get access to someone who's possibly much, much older. And then like they maybe tell you about the wisdom of life and all sorts of things that your other teenage friends might not talk to you about. Which I guess is in some sense, like what we are starting to see when people have access to an AI companion and just talk about topics that people their age might not be talking about or thinking about. Yeah. But I think it's so true because people want companionship, right? So this, we are just social beings. You look at monkeys, tall and a little yeah. tribe already, right? And they don't like other tribes, right? So by nature, we're just pro-social and loneliness is a signal to our body and brains that we don't like it and we should hang out people that actually accept us who we are, find our tribe. It's just that, of course, first of all, tribes are getting so differentiated <laughs> in the sense that in the real world, like myself, okay, I love sci-fi, I like venture capital, I like doing startups, I'm based in Singapore. Like that tribe is such a niche tribe that actually when I hang out with most people, I can't talk about those things because if I hang out with my best friends from yeah, in business in America, this is a different domain. When we hang out, my true self doesn't come out, right? Because I'm just a tribe with them because we share that university experience, but we have to average it out or dilute the experience because, but it's okay because we are normal human beings. Mm. But of course now with Reddit, now you can subdivide your niche where you're like, okay, I can perf create this perfect algorithm, which perfectly affirms that me with the content that I want, because these are all the dimensions I have and I don't need to moderate myself. And then now we have we see this AI companions as like a supercharged version of that. Whereas not just a feed of information, but now it's a two way feed where I'll be like this companion can already today, and I use that on the perplexity for the search engine and ChatGPT. I was out in the Philippines and I was looking at these fish and had blue skeletons. And I was like, oh, tell me about these blue skeletons. Why does it happen? And so I was having this wonderful two-way conversation, <laughs> effectively, right? Of course, over chat, learning why the fish that we just caught had blue skeleton bones, which would be a really weird topic if I was suddenly talking to you about it. Like, oh my God, Jeremy is so boring. Why is he talking about <laughs> this? AI search engine was basically having a conversation with me and I, had, I was totally engaged for that half an hour on a boat doing a deep dive research on fish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. there's two parts I want to pick up on, right? I think one you mentioned on universal experiences and how that sort of either brings together or divides like people from different parts of the world and from different backgrounds. I guess the interesting thing about games is that even though you might be from very different parts of the world or have very different backgrounds and perspectives, the game world now becomes that shared universal experience where you can build a relationship and have something to talk about with someone in game, even though you might be on opposite sides of the world and on opposite time zones. And the, I think the other question I had was like, don't you think as AI companions get more and more engaging, interesting, informative, it possibly also just it, it increases the loneliness problem, which was like why it got created in the first place. You stop spending time talking to people on the boat. You spend more time talking to like perplexity about the blue skeletons. Yeah, it's a real problem because it's a substitute, right? You spend an, an hour with an AI companion, your chat GPT is an hour away from somebody or something else, right? Like work has to be get done. Real people all need to be talked to. So there is a trade-off. I don't think it's a... Uh, Time doesn't come from anywhere, right? I always like tell people, it's like Netflix at one point was like our biggest competitor's sleep, right? Because they're saying like, in order to watch one more hour of Netflix, people are sacrificing their sleep in order to get a one more hour of Netflix, which is sounds highly destructive to the... <laughs> you think about it. It's like, it's like the cigarette company is like, our biggest competitor is exercise. You get exercise by dolphins yeah. or you just smoke a cigarette. Right? Yeah. You know, if you think about it, the trade for spending an hour of an AI companion is spending it with a real human, right? And so I think there's this interesting ripple effect where... Obviously, you benefit from having an ultra process humanity. Right? So you benefit because you used to hang out with 10 people and 10% of the time, they were super nice to you. And then now you've squeezed the juice from the orange and now you have orange juice, right? Which is now you took that 10% and you, times 10 and you made it 100% perfect ultra process humanity yeah. that's in your AI container. And then you have it and you absorb it. And the truth is you benefit as a consumer. But what's interesting is that you also removes you from you being a human to somebody else. And I think that's obvious because I'm a dad of kids, right? 
is my kids need me. They need me to hang out, socialize with them, joke with them, yeah. make fun of various things. Yeah. They need that because it's not because they enjoy it. Of course they enjoy it. And obviously I enjoy it as well. But the thing is, if I didn't socialize them, they wouldn't become human beings. Yeah. Does it make sense? They wouldn't know what to do if I was replaced with a wolf. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's the joke about yeah, kids yeah. raised by wolves, right? Then the kid's going to become like, I'm a wolf, right? <laughs> because, and then they're raised by a wolf. I don't know, the wolf children, sorry. These children are raised by dogs or wolves in the wild. So they become feral or wild, right? And so these kids require that socialization by us. So the same thing is, if I'm spending all my time, tomorrow I'm like, bye. I'm going to spend the rest of my entire day using ChatGPT or some AI companion, then you lose out on my socialization yeah. with you. And then you'll be like, oh, now I feel more lonely <laughs> because Jeremy's not hanging out with me. So what you got to do? You for a while, you'll find other human friends, but then you can be like, you know what? You can also use ChatGPT, yeah. right? And then we'll both use ChatGPT together. We're just kind of dating as well. Like when we start out using dating apps, and I never got on it because I married it, but what we see from people using dating apps is you go on a dating app. Sorry, let me say it again. It's what we see with dating apps. So I remember that I was using OkCupid and it was this fun way to date on top of the real world. So OkCupid was like, okay, here's a fun way to fill out a thousand questions about yourself. And it's a complimentary way, yeah. if that makes sense, to date somebody because you're still meeting in real life and mm -hmm. I met my wife, volunteering, etc. But now what's happened is that this has displaced the real world, right? Now it's becoming like less normal, less possible to date in real life. It's weird or I have a problem with you asking somebody out in real life, even though most people used to meet via work because that's where people hung out in real life, right? And now the digital space has become the primary space, right? In a sense. So dating today, and I think in the future, when people say, oh, I'm going to meet somebody, going online is going to be the primary space. And the meet space is going to be the secondary weirdo space for some people, right? So it's interesting where I think to some extent, companionship, we are the last generation where companionship is going to be seen as the primary space is in the meat space. I think the next generation of a generation alpha, like companionship is going to be primarily the digital space. And then for some people, the secondary space will be the meat space of companionship. Yeah. I actually thought the point you brought up about how you think about the kids is interesting. Yeah. As a parent, how do you think about AI companions for your kids? For the longest time, kids have suffered from probably not so great childhoods when parents were busy at work and all of that. Would you want to create an AI model of yourself where your kid can just play with and then you get an insight into what your kid is thinking and wondering about the entire day? The AI companion is just going to become a better parent than me in many ways. If you think about it, like they're never sad. They're always available at 1 a.m., 2 a.m. They are as smart as every human being in the world combined, right? There's this good old Jeremy. Says, hey, dad, like, why is the sun yellow? And I'm like, nuclear fusion. <laughs> and, and the light comes out. And then I believe that it gets filtered by the atmosphere so that it's yellow. And I don't even know if that's true, but that's like the best I can do in terms of explanation, which is quite, because obviously as a four-year-old, she's not going to like probe too deeply. But you can imagine, you know what? That was like a maybe a... A B minus. As a parent, if you think about it, like Jeremy, it's ChatGPT. You could probably have been more factually correct because of, I don't know, all these reasons. And you could probably use a better analogy than what you just did. And then, yeah, so if you ask me, yeah, I think ChatGPT or some future parenting AI as a service solution, yeah, I think technologically, in terms of capability, it's going to be yeah. superior to every yeah. parent. I, I think what's going to be interesting is actually the downstream sociological implications of that. And I think it's going to be interesting because I think in a thousand years, I think this would be done. Right now, who handles teaching for teachers in school, right? From primary one to university is a human person teaching. But it's not you as a parent, right? Because historically, you go back a thousand years ago, who was teaching you? Like only the rich could get yeah. this public education system. And so the parents had to teach their kids themselves, right? Now parents don't have to teach at university, they don't have to teach math, they don't teach anything. So it's taken over by the state. It's taken over by the system, right? So yeah, you can imagine a situation where in a thousand years, first of all, more things will be taught by AI. Yeah. And secondly, more years of your life will be taught by AI, right? And so yeah, in a thousand years, I think every kid will be raised by AI in a thousand years. I think 
what's going to be interesting is in the next, from my perspective, the next 20 years, first of all, because my kid is four years old. So my responsibility for her ends around their twenties, obviously. So I think it's still very early in the game of AI companions. And any probably like in the context of today, I'm only going to predict next 20 years. So I'm just saying the end goal is very clear. It's, we all know, we all know that nobody's going to drive cars in a thousand years, right? Nobody wants to drive a car, right? Because it's a chore, obviously. So we can make it fun, et cetera. But it's a chore because, and it's a chore not because it wasn't fun. When you go back 50 years ago, driving a car was fun. It's just that there's so many more fun things to do, watch TikTok or play games that you could be doing so that driving becomes a chore relative to those things. Just like horseback riding, right? Today, you can say horse, riding a horse is fun, but you go by 500 years ago, there's no alternative to riding horses to get from point A to point B. And now nobody rides horses, right? The only people who ride horses are playing those people are playing sports or they just enjoy horseback riding. So like that skill that used to be mandatory for people of the middle class in England no longer exists today. So today we know, so I'm just saying, today we drive and we expect everybody to learn how to drive. I remember when I was like 18 years old in the army, everybody was like, oh, I got my driving license. And everyone was like, oh, I should also get my driving license because it was a social proof. Like it was expected everybody would drive. And then, but do you expect Generation Alpha now that everybody has self-driving cars? Yeah. Already today at Gen Z, the people who know how to drive is a much smaller percentage compared to previous generations. And they drive I'm less. part of that. That statistic, unfortunately. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. Talk. Yeah. Whoa. listen to your elders. <laughs> you should learn how to drive. You have to be yeah, a man. A Real life. men drive. They don't like wussy out and be driven around. What if happens if your boss needs to have a ride and you can't drive? So these are the life skills that we assume yeah. were totally normal, but now it's been broken, right? So the same thing, I think, when we look at teaching, we rationalize it, more of it, we digitize. And I think the future is that parenting, it will eventually be seen in some ways to be a chore by some people. And as a result, it will be digitized and be fulfilled by AI. And from a consumer perspective, I think, yeah, from a kid perspective, you've got to absorb information for anybody as long as it looks human, right? They love cartoons, they see Peppa Pig, right? They see Disney characters, yep. right? Cinderella, like, as long as they look vaguely human, they're like, great, I absorbed the information. Like, I want to be a little mermaid. I want to be cool like Jasmine, you know, in um, Aladdin. Like they're already absorbing all this information already. So to them, they're just little sponges. But definitely not a problem. Yeah. I feel like in the future, it would be like, instead of a kid coming and say, hey, Papa, I want to buy like a toy. I don't know, Toys R Us. They'd be like, oh, I want to buy this like AI, like uh, Cinderella chatbot that will talk to me in Cinderella voice and personality. And would you want to limit that sort of access to AI early on? Like, how do you think about showing your kid the world of AI, especially as a techie? You know, I think that what's interesting is that there is a techie part, but there's also a social economic class dynamic to it. So what I mean by that is that I think right now, a lot of techies are actually more against the use of AI companions as parents, from my perspective, than for it. Versus people who not techie, like I also ambivalent about it, but so let's unpack that a little bit. First of all, AI companionship is very cheap. So what I mean by that is that it's effectively free on our phones today for ChatGPT and perplexity. And I think the way of the future that we see is that for AI companions is that they're going to go for as low a price because the scale compute and the cost of compute is dropping for more scale, right? So what that means is that this is going to be very cheap. It's going to be like conflicts. Does it make sense? And sugar is also cheap, right? Because, and I think that what we see for techies and people of high socioeconomic class is they don't give their kids conflicts. Even though, what I mean by that is you go back a hundred years ago, it was actually expensive to feed kids because, and then now it's very cheap to feed kids because now you have conflicts, you have cereals, you have sugar. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a lot of whatever the stuff is, right? What I'm trying to say here is, and it solves the nutrition problem the same way we are talking about solving the loneliness problem yeah. or we solve the education problem. So I think, there's always going to be a dynamic where I think conflicts can 100% be the easiest solution to the nutrition problem because they're cheap, they're tasty, they're crunchy, the kids love them, and they still affect the right? So, so I think if you define the problem as I want my kid to be educated and not be lonely, then conflicts will 100% be 
the hundred percent winner. Does it make sense? So if you define, so I think AI is the perfect solution that will crush every other thing. I think it's just that when you reclassify the problem a little bit differently, which is, I want my kid not to have calories, but I want them to grow up healthy and strong, right? I'm also the type of parent that does not keep my kid conflicts, but which is a social thank, yeah, thank you for the disclaimer. Yeah, no, I'm not disclaiming. I'm saying like this is the luxury belief that you have, right? That as a parent, you're going to give them fruits, you're going to give them eggs, you're going to give them protein. And the truth is like the gap between having very little food and starving and being malnourished is a very painful thing. And obviously eating conflicts and other process actually are a huge step up in terms of improvement. Obviously, it's not optimal because your kid may become obese, he may have all these, doesn't have enough protein, blah, blah, blah. So the high socioeconomic people are going to put one bound higher. Does it make sense? And the gain is not as high, but from switching to protein and organic, et cetera, et cetera. But it is an advantage, right? So I think what's interesting, I'm just trying to say here is I think when he talks about like hanging out with your kids and socializing them and helping them grow up, yeah, having nobody in the home is the worst of all, right? And so that's why historically people would be like, hey, don't switch on the TV and leave the kids in front of the TV because a lot of people did that so that they could go to work and everything. And TV consumption is today correlated to a low socioeconomic class activity. Parents of high socioeconomic class don't let their kids watch as much TV as TV as compared to low socioeconomic classes. But it makes sense because as a kid, you put in front of the TV, you switch it on, the cartoon, the 100% paying attention, you don't have to worry about anything. It's very expensive to have a human hang out with your kid for you know, 15 hours of the day. So I think AI companions with replacing Sesame Street and replacing your Peppa Pig cartoon will be a huge upgrade if that makes sense, right? It'll be it's just like conflicts with a huge upgrade to having nothing to eat. I think it'd be a big upgrade for a lot of people. So I think it's a beneficial component. But wait, I think talk about techies, what they're doing, I think most people are actually moving towards more expensive, which is, okay, we want to spend more time. We need to make sure that we hang out with other parents. Bring uh, the kids to ski trips with other parents. Exactly. <laughs> John Tan uh, is doing yeah. that with his ski camps. And but it's, but it's a very expensive, but it's a very powerful education experience, right? If it's a, as a kid, instead of getting a digital penny in, which is free, learn about skiing, but I think you can learn a lot about skiing through the digital companions. Now you can go for a very expensive experience it's not that experience, but it's experience compared to all other things in life, right? And this is a luxury to hang out with other parents, other kids, and learn how to ski together. So I really, I think one can say is, I think I'm gonna, we're gonna see the barbell effect on parenting, if that makes sense. Similar to how we see content today is like a barbell, right? So on one side, obviously, is your long tail of every random piece of content and yeah. vlog and podcast, like ourselves, is that long tail, but it's perfectly differentiated for your niche, or however big that niche is for your long tail. And then on the other side, you have your blockbusters, right? So yesterday I was watching like Wolverine versus Cool, right? Which was like the must watch for Marvel fans and comic book fans. So I watched that, but it was really good. It was very expensive to build as a movie from other movies. It was very large where it was like very huge hit. And so everybody felt like they should watch it. There's a barbell effect. So I think there's going to be a barbell effect for parenting as well, where I think you're going to have uh, AI companions or parents and the persona of parenting, mom, dad, uncle, aunt, grandfather, sage, grandmother. So that's going to be a barbell where it's going to be super cheap, low cost, free, effectively. And then obviously you have your other side, which is going to be like organic parenting, right? Humanely raised, a lot of in-person time, communal. And I think there's going to be a barbell. And some kids are going to be like 100% zero. Some kids will be 100% zero. But of course, I think what we're going to see as well is that parents are going to be like 80%, 20%, 20%, 80%. But what can I say here is that they wouldn't have that time where it's under the ground. Does it make sense? So they might be like, okay, for well, five hours of the day, they are at a really good school. I'm just talking about the techies here, right? Then for two hours of the day, that we a really good AI companion that's going to focus on them and drilling them on math. Then one hour will, will be with this really important person in your life, maybe grandmother, grandfather, and then the next three hours is me. But this is how every hour is very processed, if that makes sense, very efficient, very effective. I think that's how the techies are going to optimize it. It's almost like that commodification of the basic stuff, right? Like mm -hmm. knowledge, very basic level, like companionship. And then on the other side, like 
the stuff that gets more and more scarce is your dynamic, in-person, very multi-directional relationships, which will not just include the good stuff, but also the bad stuff, right? I guess with AI, you can almost eventually configure it to be very perfect and almost sterile in that it only does and say the good things to you. Whereas I think in the in-person world, you still have kids bullying each other and it'll still be a very Darwinian environment where the popular kids come out top. But that also means I think kids growing up have a much more realistic view of human beings and human society, which I guess for the medium to long term is probably a lot better of, I guess, training than just seeing the world of nice AI characters like hang out with each other. You're 100% right, which is that what are we trying to solve here, right? Yeah, you know I mean, if you go back 70, 80 years ago, it was like World War II, right? People had ration cards and they could only get a certain amount of rice or bread. People literally were starving. And the processed food industry saved the world, right? They spam. Just fantastic. I don't know yeah. what kind of meat it is, but is it meat? No, Delicious I meat? I still have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to find out either. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And if you eat that, you have enough calories for your whole day. And it's always good, no matter how hot it is, no matter how cold it is, you eat spam and you fry it up in a million different ways. Spam saves the world, right? You know, and a lot of everything else, right? Your cookies, your pasta, like processed food industry saved the world. And we no longer have a malnourishment or hunger problem in most of the world where the processed food industry exists, right? You can go to anywhere in Southeast Asia and you can get like Maggi noodle, so Indomie, mee goreng. You can get that for like cents, right? Yes. It's so cheap to get calories. And it, I think for a while, they were seen as superheroes, right? And now, of course, they're becoming a little bit more villains because now people are worried about obesity, which is a form of malnutrition, right? Uh, because you're getting nourished in uh, the, the wrong way, right? Yeah. So you eat a lot of processed foods and then so, so forth. And yeah, it's not an easy journey yeah. for a lot of folks. I think when we think about it, which is, I think if we define parenting as a loneliness problem, AI companionship will totally solve the problem and they are going to be seen as heroes. And to some extent, we're going to medicalize loneliness because even though loneliness is a totally human yeah. experience, yeah, yeah, yeah. for hundreds of thousands of years, people have been lonely. Yeah. Now we're going to be like, wow, loneliness is not a problem, yeah. right? For hundreds of thousands of years, hunger was a normal part of life. Imagine, like you go back a hundred thousand years ago, people are like, are you hungry? Yes. Now, now today you're like, like, are you hungry? Are you hungry. There's, there's so much. So food. much food, right? I was like, literally, I was like, at nine hours, that's, hungry and I should have just gone to bed like any normal human being yeah. a thousand of years. Yeah. Well, obviously what I just did was that I went on Grab and they, the line says, what are you craving? Which by the way, Grab knows what the, the language is, what are you craving? Like, what are you addicted to, by the way? <laughs> Which is a lot. What do you want? Yeah. Like, what are you craving? Yeah. You know, like, and the recommendations and engine probably knows what you've been ordering. Exactly. It knows what people like to order at like midnight as well. Exactly. So I hit it and then I got myself my, like my pork noodles, right? And then. Yeah. And you your one meal a day diet. Right? Exactly. It's horrible. By the way, if I, if you would, yeah, like hunger is a 20 minute problem. You're like, you feel the inkling of hunger, you can press the button and then you can solve it in 20 minutes, right? So to you and I, you're going to be like, yeah, I feel lonely. You know, like, because I'm a weirdo. Right? Factually, all of us are weirdos, right? I'm a weirdo, you're a weirdo. But you know, I'm lonely because I'm a weirdo and I don't want to take action to meet humans and to commune with them and sacrifice a little bit of myself to hang out with you who's also sacrificing a little bit of myself, right? Because I'm just going to stay in bed at 1 p.m. in the afternoon, yeah. feeling lonely because, and you should feel lonely if you're in bed at 1 p.m. in the afternoon. Really? Because your body is telling you that you need to get out of your bed yeah. to go meet somebody else. Yeah, and go then, for a spin class. Yeah, exactly. Loneliness is a signal that like hunger is telling you that you need food, you want yeah. food, right? So loneliness is telling you like, I need social interaction. But now, instead of hunger, waking you up in the morning to go hunt some food and pick some pear berries, and actually do the, that's what hunger was for, right? Otherwise, yeah. hunger, hunger is telling you you need to go do hunting and that's that. So you need to switch off your notification, yeah. So it's like hunger, right? It was what woke up the caveman to go hunt food and get nutrition, right? Yeah. So otherwise you'd just be in bed all day and then you just die from being a lazy caveman, right? So now we solved that ourselves. Yeah. So when it comes to companionship, you go and be in, in bed at 1 p.m. and you're like, hit the button, you're like, oh. Wow, I'm having this great conversation with 50 people in this giant networking mixer and it all happened 
to perfectly affirm me who I am. Wow, today at a dinner party, I can imagine I'm a video call. I'm at a party in my bed at 1pm. So I met a guy, a sci-fi guy, after sci-fi guy. I met the lady who likes to talk about venture capital. Like, all these can be AI companions. And then my, it's not that my lonely signal is 100% satiated all the time. And so I think if we reformulate the problem, I think we're going to solve the loneliness problem because loneliness is going to become a five-minute problem. Yeah. It only exists for five minutes. I think what's going to happen after this and what the problem is, are we actually socializing people to become humans? <laughs> you know, AI terminals. Yeah, your description reminds me of the days of Clubhouse, you know, that audio app. You could just be in bed and you can just hop on into a room and just like talk shit with people. Um, and stuff like actually going out and hanging out with real people. Um, and I remember I had friends who gave me so much shit for, Hey, why are you hosting so many clubhouse rooms? Can you just come down and hang out with us? You know, in the buttery where everyone's like cooking food and just talking, actually having real in-person conversations. Yeah. So it's the same, right? With the food delivery, like examples, like we almost are enabled to be like lazy to do the proper right things because of technology and how it's just like self-serving us on a very immediate instant level and giving us that gratification, right? Instead of working towards fulfilling that inner desire, whether it's hunger, loneliness, yeah. emotions. Yeah. It was such a huge dopamine hit, right? Yeah. You and I were together. We created uh, Southeast Asia Technology Club. Yeah, 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 which yeah, was yeah, like yeah. hundreds of thousands of people. Yeah. And then we were like, I felt amazing because you were like, you know, I mean, because it felt like when you were in the world, you're like, wow, wow. there's so many people. There's hundreds of thousands of people listening to you. It feels great on a point. But then if you, if you zoom out from the camera, you're like, oh, maybe it's like hunched over the desk. Yeah, yeah like just sitting there in a fetal position and talking for two, three hours. Yeah, yeah it's like, and then after the guy, Jeremy finishes and he's like, oh, I feel very tired. And you're like, yeah, because you're not out there talking like a normal human being. Yeah. It was like, Jeremy became effectively a brain with eyeballs. And a, it was like, it's just like directly hooked into the universe, like Matrix. So it's, oh, and it, but I think of course, there's a hundred thousand people who are also simultaneously plugged in. And all of us were not socializing in real life. Uh, first, once the pandemic ended and lockdown ended, the truth was Clubhouse was an insufficient product because people were rude. They couldn't hang out with the right small tribes, all this other stuff. Yeah. So a lot of that energy left the digital world. Now we went back to the real world. But of course, I think a lot of those learnings about those digital worlds still exist. And now with AI companions, they're going to become more powerful as an engine. So I think that, I think we're going to see the pushback happen, which is I think 95% of the world to not, you know, if no, not like ninety nine percent of the world is going to eat processed, food. and only the top one percent will not eat processed food. They'll eat organic. They'll try to eat natural. They will avoid eating porky and yeah. cats, yeah, and cookies. Yeah, I mean, they're yeah. going to stay okay on that. And today, what's interesting is that in the processed food industry and the diet, whatever it is, if you said I only eat natural food that hundreds of thousands of years of people ate, you'll be seen as dieting. Does that make sense? If you eat hawker food and fried stuff, a lot of starch and lard and all other stuff, that would be considered natural food because your parents ate it, your grandparents ate it. But what I'm trying to say is there's an unnatural food because it didn't exist a hundred years ago. So what's going to happen is that the top 1% who only eat natural foods like paleo, like foods that are like not processed in a significant way, they're going to be seen as weird people who diet. Does it make sense? It's a luxury belief yeah. because it's a very expensive belief to not eat. Have you ever tried eating a thousand calories from potato chips versus eating a thousand calories from steak? It's like the price difference is literally a hundred X and also a lot more fun, right? A bag of potato chips. But a thousand calories is not that large actually if you put it together. So I think same thing for parenting. I see that for companionship. I think 99% of the world is just go straight to AI, digital companions. Now that the cost of social interaction is effectively zero. And more importantly, it's one-sided. Because now it can, it's on demand at any time of your day. And only the top 1% of people will actually get to have, you know, in-person communications of the quality they want to have. Yeah. I think as you were describing that, what struck me was that search engines have been around for forever, right? Libraries as well, books. But people still default to trusted, credible, actual human beings for knowledge and wisdom and questions. And I think... Maybe what we will see in the future is we won't see that many generic AI engines or companions, but maybe every AI companion would be tied to an actual human being, right? Like Jeremy GPT or like Lawrence Wong GPT, right? Um, where tied to the personality and 
I guess, the insights that an actual person has. Yeah, 100% watches that. And I'm going to tighten that. I, I think it's less tight with people. It's going to be tied to brands. So if you look at shirts, like 300 years ago, everybody's clothes was made by a local tailor, right? Yeah. Now, obviously it's in your village or your town, your city, but people specialized and became tailors, right? But it was done by a human being. Right. And then the British invented this thing called the cotton mill and the ability for automated weaving using like electricity, et cetera. And then suddenly it became this world where everybody in Asia was making cotton and then they'll ship it to the UK, when the UK was made into clothes and then they sold the clothes back to us and then all your mass tailors all went out of business and a lot of us are wearing Western dress and attire because that's what's cheap, right? Yeah. And now if you look at today's age, like you're wearing a Koi Lhasa shirt. Like so, and he gave me the promo code. Yeah, yeah. You, you want to give us one of the best shirts? No, no, no I, I'm not officially sponsored. You're not officially but sponsored, yeah. Really comfortable batik uh, polo t-shirts for all occasion. Okay. All right. You can ask, give us a sponsor code. <laughs> the promotion. Uh, and yeah, I'm wearing a Uniqlo shirt right now. So it's tied to a brand, right? So all clothes today versus 300 years ago, all clothes are no longer made by John down the street. Okay, not even John in Asia, right? Mr. Lin or however it is. Yeah. All of it's now made by brands, right? Yeah. Uh, and to you, Koi Lhasa is a, this is a proudly Southeast Asian brand that's Batik inspired and so forth. So I think the brands for AI companions will be, some of it will be like Southeast Asia, some of it will be tied to say personality, some of it will be tied to corporations. I think it's Blue Bodies is going to be a companion. And it's interesting because Right now, as you say Google, you say Siri, there's a bunch of names that you say stuff, right? And then all those words now, like there's so many devices that will actually wake up the moment you say it. And so now we can't even say those words because now you're like, I can't call a kid Siri or Alex, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. or Alexander, because all the words all wake up straight away. I think the world is already filled by these three omnipresent Google. Siri, Alexa is omnipresent everywhere now on these devices. So more and more names and brands will get eaten up by this always on, always surveillance. AI companion that will wake up the moment you're like, hey, Adriel, and suddenly, hey, I'm talking to you, yeah. person, and suddenly the Adriel GPT wakes up, she always, I need to draw a line up so I can just keep it. So then I'll be like, uh, I'm talking to the real one. No, I'm available right now. Take faster than him. I'm here, and I don't use filler words. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think the world in 100 years is like 99% of the people just use digital companions most of the time, yeah. 80% of the time. And 1% of the world will use real humans um, 80% of the time. And it's going to be seen as a class divide thing. Because the truth is, the most expensive thing in the world today is what? It's not TVs. TVs got super cheap, by the way. In fact, TVs is the only device that got better in resolution and got cheaper over time, right? Because of manufacturing and global outsourcing. But it's the same for your hardware services that have scaled, right? Because of the manufacturing assembly. Same thing for your iPhones, to your massage chairs, to your Terra gun. All your, your electronics have gotten cheaper and cheaper. And also software has gotten cheaper and cheaper, right? So now in the past, to make a, in the past, the sequence of human genome cost you effectively a billion dollars about 20 years ago. And today the cost of sequence of human genome is like a thousand dollars. That thousand X difference over 20 years, right? It was such a huge difference. Software has happened for that as well. So what's the expensive? Humans. Humans are the most expensive thing. If you go to a school, why is university school expensive? Because of humans. It's all done by humans. If you look at childcare, whether you're getting a nanny in America or you're going to a daycare center, that was the biggest cost driver. Humans. Because we are the most expensive because we are so productive doing other things. We could be making hardware chips. We could be working as an accountant. There's so many productive industries. And so it's something called warmers, cost disease, because we are more productive doing other things. Therefore, the cost of labor for us to do something like take care of kids will become more expensive yeah. by nature as a substitution effect. Because otherwise, if I'm being paid too low to be a teacher, I'm just going to become a Grab or Uber driver, right? Yeah. So that cost disease or cost competition for the cost of labor for what it can be done. What I'm just trying to say is like the cost of parenting is going to go up. The cost of childcare is going to go up because humans are more productive, which means they're more expensive to maintain, which means they're more expensive to hire and keep around. 
which means that cost of childcare is going to go up, which means that you choosing to be a full-time parent is going to go up because it's a substitute effect. And so there's this interesting piece where basically it's going to become a luxury good. That's it. You know, like it's, it's like Apple watches used to be seen as luxury items. I don't know if you know yeah. this. Five days old, like Apple watches. Wow. Like you're really rich to wear Apple watches. Yeah. And I was gotten to the point now where some people are saying like, wow, if you wear an Apple watch, is a middle class really? price. Really? Okay. Yeah. You that I don't have an Apple watch yet, so I shall not buy it. It's already happening. Is it's, it's, it's gotten cheaper. So now wearing Apple watch is not really considered an upper class thing. It's just considered a middle class item, right? It's not an upper class what they're wearing now. They're wearing like Rolexes and Aura rings. And yeah, like they quite go for the next thing that's more expensive. So anyway, I'm just trying to say here is like, there's an interesting dynamic where I think we're going to see that for parenting as well. Interesting. It's been such a fun morning, like chatting through our experiences in the virtual worlds with all this strange virtual relationships with people with super different backgrounds, opposite sides of the world, time zones and all that to like what it means for parenting, right? The cost of parenting and how parenting could potentially get like augmented slash disrupted by things like your AI companions and just like exploring the very dystopian, but very near future. Yeah. And, you know, super excited to see like how things will evolve. It's not dystopian if the consumer pays for it. Fair. Yeah. Which is also quite depressing. But it's it's a lot like that. Nice. But it's like Big, Big Brother, Brother, right? The story yeah, of Big yeah, Brother. Yeah. It's like, oh, everything is watching. It's like, oh, yeah. we just made it into Apple and Google devices and we pay for it. And we pay for the quality versions of it, right? Yeah. So we willingly submit, submit our lives to the devices. Who yeah. then submit our lives to Big Brother. Yeah, exactly.